battling the big one, AI's fight to eliminate cancer. And I'd like to welcome on our illustrious uh, leading figure in this world. So James Peach has got a long history in cancer and genomics and is now the commercial director of DataCan, working to increase patient access, patient approved in fact, access uh, and analysis to UK cancer data. Thank you, James. Thanks very much, Vernon, um, and welcome everyone to this session. I'm particularly excited. Um, for, for most people, 2020 was the year of the pandemic uh, for a close family member, of family friend of mine, and another, um, it was a year of a cancer diagnosis. Uh, and I'm delighted to say that both of them have made it through the diagnosis and the treatment and are doing well. But for me, it strikes me as completely ridiculous that for neither of them, their care was improved or chosen by the advanced data science, the AI machine learning that I know is available in medical research today. So really, that's the topic of the conversation. How will AI help us to eliminate cancer? We're joined today by two committed and impressive leaders working every day to use data science to beat cancer, Sarah Karish of Kieran Medical and Emmy Gal of Ezra. So the session will kick off with each of their initial headlines on how they and their organizations are using AI against cancer and their personal predictions for the next 10 years and beyond. I'll add some of my thoughts and then we'll try and discuss major topics such as the affordability of AI driven cancer care, the need for data, new data or sharing data and any risks there might be in applying AI to cancer care before taking some of your questions in Q&A. So let's start off with a couple of minutes from Emmy Gal, Chief Exec and Co-Founder of Esri, on how AI will help us eliminate cancer. Emmy, to you. Thank you, James. Uh, excited to be here, everyone. Um, it's a bit uh, unusual because I'm, I'm used to getting feedback from the audience and, and, uh, when, I, when I present, um, but I, I will do my best. Um, I, as James said, my name is Emmy. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Ezra. Uh, what we do at Ezra is we help people detect cancer early using a full body MRI powered by AI. Um, I got to focus on Ezra because I'm personally at high risk for cancer. I'm at high risk for melanoma. I have, uh, I have cancer in my family, which led to a few years ago, me volunteering for a nonprofit in my home country, Romania, that builds hospices that care for cancer patients. And in being involved with hospice, I realized that the main reason why uh, people die or end up in a hospice because of cancer is because they're detected late. And the main reason people are detected late is because there's no way to screen for cancer everywhere in the body that's fast, accurate, and affordable. That's what we're trying to build at Ezra. We've, we've scanned over about 1,000 people over the past 18 months, and we've helped 13% of our members find potential cancer. And uh, I'm excited about uh, talking today about how we can leverage AI and, and full body MRIs to help everyone in the world detect cancer early. Great, thanks very much, Emmy. And now uh, to Sarah Karish, Chief Strategy Officer of Kieran Medical. I just want to say yeah, thank you, James. On behalf of the audience, you did a great job, Emmy. Um, and what, a, what an exciting, meaningful space to be working in. I think I'd like to start by um, the moment when I started to understand that um, the whole world of cancer is changing. I was very lucky to collaborate with now President Biden's precision medicine team, cancer team at the White House um, about five years ago. And it was a time when it became apparent that there were a whole slew of new kinds of treatments and therapies um, that were going to revolutionize cancer care. And it was that moment when I first thought that and hoped that in 10, I'm in 10 years time, that the actual word cancer would have a different meaning. And that when you got a cancer diagnosis, that it wouldn't have the same, oh my God, I'm gonna die. It would be like, okay, I know this can be treated. So I think the therapies are, as you said, are, are making huge strides in addressing that fundamental problem of how we treat cancer. But at the same time, it was also apparent that there was this underpinning architecture of data and AI and insight that was missing. There was that, it's quite horrifying um, when you start to look into the accuracy of cancer scans or the diagnosis of scans for cancer. Um, and Michael Lewis, in one of his famous books, took a, took a series of, uh, sorry, he reported on a, on a study that showed that radiologists themselves would make a different diagnosis six months on as to whether a cancer in the abdomen was actually a cancer. It's a very difficult thing to do. 
Um, and it seems to me and to so many people working in this space that AI is obvious that it can make a really important contribution, not replacing radiologists, but actually providing them with better tools so you get the earlier diagnosis and you get the more accurate um, sense of whether a disease is progressing or, regress or regressing in concert with these new drugs. So it's an incredibly exciting time. And at Current Medical specifically, we're focused on building that backbone, that informatics insight AI backbone that informs and the early detection of cancer, but also the monitoring of the disease. And our first um, suite of products are the Mia family, and they've been designed to detect breast cancer. And uh, we're seeing now wonderful traction throughout the world, specifically in the UK, in America, and all over the world. Um, because the, not only is the technology ready and proven, but there's a huge need. Um, to your point, James, you know, cancer is one of those disease areas that has suffered terribly because of COVID. And 1.3 million women in the UK alone weren't screened last year. Massive workforce crisis, huge backlog. We think the technology is ready, not just our technology, but there are other technologies ready um, to be able to actually start solving that problem. And I think that inflection point is exactly where we're at and we're going to see very exciting things in just the next several months. Brilliant. Um, thanks very much, Sarah. And a, a point there you said about the Biden initiative really rings true with a piece of work we were doing on the UK um, cancer strategy maybe 10 years ago when we realised that uh, the UK had significantly worse cancer outcomes than the rest of Europe, including the richer and the less rich nations. Um, we could tell that. The next question was why we didn't know. Um, and I think it's really important that people who are watching this understand that the data out there is very rarely as good as we want it to be. Um, and it's only as we go through the process of companies like yourselves looking in the data and trying to draw insights from them that we realize that we can draw these insights, but the data sometimes is getting in our way. Um, so in, in my role in DataCan, we spend our time effectively doing data science projects. So we do large scale analytics on clinical records from hospitals or GPs, primary care. We try and bring together as much data as we can to try and understand what treatments are working or are not working in the real world. Um, and, and what we run into on a daily basis is that that data is only as good as what it was intended for. And generally it's intended for billing to basically show the central government how much they should be paying that hospital or for performance management to show that we are, we are treating patients quickly enough to hit the targets. Um, and it's not there for research. So it means when you try and look through it for research, you realize that there's actually quite a lot of gaps in there. And, and even much of the data, I think um, uh, about 80% um, of the data is not in any structured fields anywhere. It is in written notes. Um, and that's okay, because at the time you just use that to deliver the care on the day, but it's not okay for research. And one of the good things that AI is bringing to us in data can on a day-to-day -day basis is that you can use a AI, generally it's NLP, to look through those unstructured notes, those free text points, to extract out the data we can then use for the data science. So, so AI is already helping us in terms of clinical research make the data we have five times as large because we're bringing all that through from the unstructured note into structured data. And that's been an incredible benefit we've seen so far. And then, Touching on, on, a, on, a, on a different point, um, much of the press coverage about cancer is about wonder drugs and new drugs that are coming in and how these drugs may or may not help. But coming back to Amy's point, the great majority of cancers that are cured are cured by surgery. And the only way we can get those surgeries to work is if we find the cancer early enough that it hasn't grown to be dangerous or it hasn't spread across the organs, at which point you can't actually do surgery on it. So we are in a world where we can use uh, both image techniques, such as those used by Ezra and Kiron, to find these cancer earlier, or we can use bloodborne markers, such as those used by Grail or um, others, to try and understand are there characteristic DNA damage markers in the blood. Now, this is great, this is fantastic, and this is real progress because it allows us to do that surgery earlier, but it is bringing us closer to a point where the risk and benefit of that surgery becomes more tricky. So right now, taking off a skin mole, a precancerous skin mole, it is a clear decision. Why wouldn't you do that? But if you have something deep inside your body that may or may not turn into a cancer in 10 years' time, cancer is no longer about treating the disease you have. It's about preventing the disease you might have. And I think it'll be really interesting to see how AI and the use of data in cancer for early detection will lead us into a position of managing risk as much as actually curing the cancer we have in front of us.
And one final point from, from my experience is that we, we in DataCan have the aim to learn from every case of cancer. You know, there is millions of people getting cancer every year. Why are we not bringing that data together? So we're helping each doctor with that information in real time. Because your, your cancer doctor probably got trained 10 years ago. And 10 years ago, he got trained on textbooks that were written five years ago. So he's already 15 years back. And OK, he, he, he or she is getting the information from the patients that come through their practice and the network of the people around them but they're not bringing together the millions of patients across the world. And what I really hope is that some of the new data science techniques allow us to bring together patients like you so that the doctor can look in real time and say, somebody with your characteristics had these treatments and had these outcomes, and therefore right now, what you should do is this or that. And that, that is a lovely vision, but where does that leave the doctor? You know, we have some fantastically good oncologists, surgeons, what happens to their role and how do we therefore move the profession of oncologists from one that is based on them learning from the past to one where they're able to access the data of the present? Anyway, so all, all this just to illustrate that um, cancer is a terrible disease, but we have amazing techniques now to deal with it and fight it. And I think AI is probably one of the most promising of those. So. And anyway, um, for the, um, I see there's a question in the Q&A already. We will get to those after a little bit of discussion, but please do put more questions in that Q&A because we really want to help you with any questions that you have. Um, but just to come back to a, a point we mentioned right at the beginning, and um, uh, Emmy, if I could start with you on this question. This is around the affordability of AI-driven cancer care. What, what do you think that the AI-driven cancer care that we are working to develop might have in terms of impact on the affordability of cancer care, either in rich or in developing countries? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, James. So um, I'll take MRI as an example because that's kind of what we're closest to at ESRA. And there are the other types of imaging modalities, ultrasound, CT, et cetera. But in MRI in particular, uh, getting a full body MRI before ESRA used to cost ten to $15,000 because you would have to go and do 45 minute scans of the head, the neck, abdomen, pelvic area. Uh, and that costs a lot of money. What we're doing is we're employing AIs and technology to decrease the scan time, decrease the interpretation time in order to drive down the cost. And then we're passing those cost savings to our customers in order to be able to, for them to be able to afford a full body MRI. And as a result, the Ezra full body scan costs $2,000. And I believe that over the next few years, we'll be able to build AI technology at Ezra and, and beyond in the industry to get to a $500 full body scan. Now, the Ezra full body screens for cancer in up to 13 organs. So if you're paying $500 for a full body scan, you can scan per cancer around $50 per cancer, which is like, uh, at that point, it also becomes um, uh, potentially useful for insurers to start covering uh, a full body scan. So I'm a big believer that like applying machine learning and, and neural network, neural networks and uh, adversarial networks, et cetera, to decrease the scan time, decrease the interpretation time, decrease the admin burden for cancer screening um, will get us to be able to offer screenings that anyone can afford. Brilliant. And, and, and this is an example of how we can make positive progress. Sarah, I know when we talked earlier, you, you said that one of our priorities for you is the equality of access to treatment. Could you give us your thoughts around the economics and the equality of the access piece? Yeah. Well, I mean, certainly it's something we think a lot about. And um, we have this mantra that we're building um, AI technology for any woman anywhere. And there are a few different components about that. One is actually just inclusivity from the start. So making sure that um, we provide access by making sure the technology works for women in different countries from different ethnic backgrounds. So we have a amazing partnerships with UCSF and Emory. So we're making sure that we build MIA for Asian women, African-American women. Um, and many other populations too. So I think it starts there in how we build the technology in terms of equality of access. And then I think, um, you know, especially, again, I'll just re reference the mammography use case. There are African countries with actually quite good infrastructure for taking mammograms and just they just don't have the radiologist to read them. And of course, that's a perfect use case uh, to be able to read those scans. You can do it remotely and to be able to provide that opinion. Um, so for sure, I think that the potential there is to really um, provide healthcare to those who haven't had it before. Um, but we do have to start with making sure that we really are thinking about that now in terms of how we build the technology and how we build distribution for the technology. 
I think these are really important points. And in, in, in my field in genetics, one of the things we worried about a lot was most of the genetic information we were developing was basically about rich white people who were close to whole genome sequencing. Um, is, is, and, and this is open to either of you, Sarah or Amy, is, is there a risk we are continuing to do that? And what can we do to make sure that the benefits of what we're developing here are not restricted to that small group? Well, it's, it's how you design your technology and it's making sure you understand what are the nuances in your technology that relate to, for example, variations? Um, it could, it doesn't, and it doesn't necessarily have to just be. Uh, it could be hardware type or genetic um, predisposition, or it could be uh, ethnic background. So it's really looking at what you're building and looking at what could be those areas of bias um, that would then mean it has limited application for a small, you know, privileged group of people. In breast screening. Uh, Breast tissue is very different depending for so for Asian women, African American women, it's very different. So it's fundamentally important that we develop and train models that work for those women in that way. But every use case is different. I just think it's, you know, you start with the basics, what are you building, for whom and, for, and why, and then looking at what might be those confounding factors. I also think another really important point on this, James, is just making sure, even before you think about that, who's at the table. Who do you have at the table? And for us, obviously, our initial products are for women. And you know, we now, I'm so so proud about this. We have 20, 26% of our tech team is women. Um, and you know, that compares to Google, for example, at 20%, which is at the high end. So it's like making sure that we have the right people at the table to ask the right questions. Um, and again, it's you know, it's up to all of us as a community to start building that in as best practice. That, that, that's brilliant because um, you, you've got me off my original topic, but in an area which I'm really interested in, which is how, how do we represent patients in this? Because, you know, um, we, half of us will go on to be patients, some of us may have been patients, and you're at high risk. So how do we make sure that in the teams that do this and in the representations we're bringing to us, we are representing that patient voice so that the data techniques that we produce and develop are sympathetic to their, their needs and their, their requirements? Um, yeah. yeah, I wanted to say that I, I do think it should be the responsibility of the AI companies building these models to ensure that they spend the energy and the resources to acquire data sets that are representative of the population. Uh, at Ezra, for example, our first AI was uh, cleared by the FDA was for prostate. And in prostate, African American men have a higher prevalence. And so we made sure that we had a, a, a kind of a large uh, proportion of our data set represented by African-American men, which meant that we had to go out, search for them, offer them scans, uh, include the scans in the, in the machine learning training data set, and then validate with a, a separate testing data set to ensure that our AI would perform well across any uh, targeted uh, demographic. It's costly, but I think it is the right thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. And I think in terms of actually involving and engaging with patients, um, again, that's a, a huge part of what we do. It's in our DNA and it starts with, are we building the right product and what do patients care about? There's numerous examples now of things like um, there was a Parkinson's drug that was being developed and, and a group of Parkinson's patients got together and they basically said, look, we don't care about any of this, all these, whatever the, the things, the problems that the drug was trying to solve, we just want to be able to control a urinary function, um, you know, and it's just, it starts again there, ask the questions, work with the patients and work with, in our case, women who are going through breast screening, how do they feel about breast screening? What are they anxious about? How do they feel about AI? Mm -hmm. We've engaged with um, an organization to basically to Tau Health and MRAD, one of our partners, to do a very large survey just to get to, you know, those attitudes and, and really try and understand um, what the patient perspective is, because only then can we build something that you know, will improve outcomes and, and be meaningful to them, which is what we want at the end of the day. So, so in, 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 in terms of listening, um, I've got a great question, actually, which has come through on the chat. So thank you very much. And please keep them coming through, which kind of focuses on the area of the risks around this. Um, and and this, this question is, what is what is our risk of finding um, early or precancerous um, lesions? which might eventually be kept in check by the body's internal self-healing mechanism. So the immune system will effectively mop them up. Um, any, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, we, we've spent a lot of time thinking about this at Ezra because um, when you look at the data, you know, 
late stage uh, cancer detection has a five year survival rate of less than 20% across, across all cancers. Early stage cancer detection has an over 80% um, uh, five-year survival rate, if you take early stage breast cancer, because Sarah was talking about that, has a 99% five-year survival rate if you find breast cancer early. It is important, however, to ensure that whenever you're finding things that where it is equivocal as to whether they will turn into a malignancy or not, the most important thing is to know and then to track it over time. So for example, um, Pancreatic cancer, the only people who survive pancreatic cancer are people who found it incidentally through some, they went skiing, they broke a rib, they did an x-ray and the doctor said, good thing, good news, your ribs are fine, but you might have pancreatic cancer. And that's because it's, it's asymptomatic until it's at a late stage. Most pancreatic cancers start as an IPMN, intrapapillary mucosal neoplasm, uh, those IPMNs may or may not turn into pancreatic cancer, and the only way to know is to just track them over time. So if you could offer a, a scan, such as an Ezra full body scan, that it does not use harmful radiation, that is safe to do, and you could track that IPMN over time, you could basically determine whether it's growing at an accelerated rate or whether something's going on. And machine learning is key to that because it helps quantify the IPMN in year one versus year two, three, four, five, and so on, which makes it for a better way to track and, and see whether it's turning into something that may have a malignant potential. I think about, um, if I could be more, and this brings to mind probably my favorite um, breast cancer oncologist slash surgeon, Dr. Laura Essman, who works out of UCSF, and there's a very good New York Times story about her. If you want to learn more about her, but essentially, she she learns a song for every patient that she gives breast cancer surgery to. She's a singer, and she's done arias, and she does pop songs, and she's amazing. Um, and in addition, she's an incredible researcher, and she is um, currently conducting trials with women who have early stage DCIS and tracking them over time. And I think fundamentally, this is the only way that we can approach it. To Emmy's point, it's about we have to do the science and we have to be able to track the development of these kinds of lesions um, to see what happens and can we leave them and how long can we leave them for. So it's sort of brave, it's brave new ground um, and, and it's going to take time to have the answers. But I think people are starting to ask the right questions. And this is re really interesting moving from a, a period where we are almost forced to intervene mm -hmm. to a really considering about how do we manage this over time and what are the techniques and how accurate are they in order to do that safely. Sorry, Amy. No, uh, the other thing I wanted to add is that when you're looking at a screening uh, uh, program or a sc screening test, you're looking at sensitivity and specificity. Ideally, you want high sensitivity, high specificity, but there's a trade-off between the two because the more sensitive a test is, the, the less specific and vice versa. To address that problem at Ezra, we believe that the, the future of cancer screening will be multimodality. So MRI has very, very high sensitivity for detecting uh, potential cancer in most organs. MRI, we're talking sensitivity of 96, 97%. It has lower specificity around 80%. If you could combine MRI with something like a ctDNA test from a company like Grail that has very, very high set, uh, specificity, 99%, but relatively low uh, sensitivity, then if you combine the two um, tests, you could actually get to an ideal screening test that mitigates the false positives from the lower specificity or the, the, the false negatives from the lower sensitivity in the ctDNA kits. So, uh, we believe that the future of cancer screening is multimodality. Uh, yeah, without doubt. A very, really good point. On that strong mo moment of agreement, I'll move us on to the next area. <laughs> and this one's around data um, and, and the availability of data and the need to us to either develop it ourselves or try and find it. And, and the question from the, from the audience is that while well, MRI, and I assume that means all imaging is digitized, are we severely limited by the other technologies and data not actually being currently digitized? Things like uh, sen other sensing and biopsies. So is, is, there a, is there a risk that effectively we just follow the data and focus on where the data is and we miss out the other areas where the data is not yet digitized? I think, um, 
I think it's really important that we identify the really important critical areas that need to be digitized. And often those efforts are in place. Um, for example, um, we work quite a lot with Leeds University and they now have digitized all their pathology. So I think, you know, I think it's just, I think we as an ecosystem need to think about what are those really important data sets that we need to structure or we need to digitize um, and, and make that part of a movement because it's happening, but it's happening slowly. And I'm not sure it's happening in a way, in a strategic way versus, you know, that this is the next thing to do. I think we need to think about it as a whole ecosystem. Uh, and I also think that, um, you know, there's there's a lot of myths about the usability of data, and I'm sure you know James and Emmy are very very familiar with this. To actually make it usable is um, is a is a is a mission in of itself. <laughs> and um, just to for everyone, as if you're thinking about developing these kinds of products, to think about that is, you know, just because there happens to be a data set, you know, it could be a, a long time before you wrestle it into a form that's meaningful. And that's God's work. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I kind of I think the, the the broad point here is that aside from data being digitized and maybe that being sl slower than we want it to, a big problem in healthcare is that uh, it's very hard to have a 360 data set of a certain patient, especially if they get treated in different locations and they get scanned in different locations. All of those different data points sit in different systems and kind of bringing all of the things into one system in order to be able to make sense of the outcome for that particular patient and doing that at scale is is uh, like it's a really really hard problem so much so that at Ezra we've we've just gone direct to consumer and we've said you know what we're gonna target consumers directly find potential cancer for them help them get follow-up diagnostic scans help them get biopsies get all of that data and know how we've done over time. Because if we relied on the existing healthcare system to get that data, we just never get it. And now we have over, over, over a thousand people for whom we have most of this data, which is becoming a, a very interesting data set to mine. Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a really interesting point that I think we're on the cusp now of some of these technologies being affordable and useful, which means there will need to be relatively small pilots where we push it over the edge until it is it is that and in, in the uk in the uh, genomic system when we put together genomics england we said we need more whole genome data um the whole genome data is not going to be generated through routine care we're going to take that risk we're going to say this data is going to be useful once we've developed it and therefore we will fund the development of whole uh, 100 000 whole genomes to do that so mm -hmm. i i think i can see this same theme kind of bubbling up in the various different areas be it imaging or genomics or in clinical data um, but with, within clinical data, it kind of comes comes back to the point at the beginning that the digitization of some of this data is something that AI is particularly good at. So it, we are moving away from a period where you had to get a data curator to go down and pull the notes from somewhere. Well, increasingly, it's digital to pull it up on a computer, um, but to actually go through those line by line and says when the doctor wrote this, they meant that. Um, I hope we are just in a short. 10 year period where that's being done with a computer on your back looking at how you're doing it so that in 2020 we don't have to do it anymore so i think there's great opportunities this is not frontline it's not exciting it as you say it's god's work it's horrible no one wants to do it but just we have to do it to make progress um, do you want, a, you to make, james do you want to make a quick plug for the uk because i think it is the most extraordinary place to do research in that respect i mean it isn't all joined up yet but there is a tremendous amount of it that it is, and that is well structured, and also just an amazing place um, to do research in the space because of the government support. The whole government AI award. Matt Hancock announced a whole slew of new awards for AI companies in the UK, and we were lucky to win one of the first ones, and it was game changing for us. So this is a shameless plug for the UK and the incredible ecosystem here for doing exactly the kind of development we're discussing. Yeah. Fantastic. And, and just to, sorry, Emmy, go ahead. No, I just want to say it's completely the opposite in the US, whereas rest of Ace, where like all, all data, states, data states are disjointed and nobody wants to uh, bring them into one uh, one unique uh, data warehouse. So, But that's, that fosters innovation, right? In terms of you, you just leapfrog the whole thing. Yeah, <laughs> out of out of necessity more than anything. Yeah. yeah. There's a lovely natural experiment going on uh, where, where in the US there is not a lot of government intervention. The data sets are quite hard to glue together, but there is a fantastic amount of biotech money and some great talent. And in the UK, you have great talent as well, 
much less investment money, but the data is much easier to do together. So we will see. I do not know what one of these. And frankly, I'm glad there are two horses in the race because this is a difficult race to win. Uh, touching on research, one of the questions from the audience is, um, um, what kind of insights from research papers um, could be um, helped through kind of AI and machine learning to be more meaningful for cancer research? Um, so this is a big question. Um, uh, and any, any, any thoughts? James, sorry, can you just re repeat the question? I didn't fully understand it. Yeah, so, so, so this is thinking about how, how AI can help us against cancer. One, one yeah. of the things we're faced with is an absolutely massive corpus of knowledge that is continually yeah. getting bigger and bigger. These research papers that are being pr produced around cancer research, some of them fantastic, some of them almost no one ever sees. Is there anything that AI can do to help us to manage and learn from that group? I think there is. I think there's a company, I think it's called Canary, who's doing something very similar in this space. So I think undoubtedly, yes. Um, and then I also think that, um, I also think that there's, there are lots of efforts around the world to come up with established methodology for evaluating the value of the research in the papers. And this is especially true in AI. Um, you know, from our perspective, we feel like we're not just developing the technology and the ways to market um, and hopefully revolutionize, revolutionizing care and the cancer environment. But also, it's a question of just how we um, how we establish the framework for evaluating AI. I mean, the big question you often hear is, is how as a radiologist or a healthcare system do I look at all these different um, products or solutions and choose one? And I think um, and I think that's about you know what are those standards? They're quite well established in the pharma industry. We need to do the same in AI. We've been part of that process, doing things like creating very carefully staged series of trials and, and bringing in a CRO for them to evaluate the trial. So I think it's, it's yes, it would be great to have AI that can help pick out those insights, but I think we also need to develop a framework and a knowledge base so that we can evaluate the value of that research, especially in the AI space, because it is definitely, this is, this is part of the frontier. I think this, this question is reminding me of a, a guy I had the pleasure to work with, uh, John Overington, who was um, who ran AI at Benevolent AI over here in the UK, and before that was in the Sanger doing Campbell. And he, his area is an area where AI has been active in cancer research for a very long time. And this is cheminformatics, so basically working out how molecules interact with other molecules. And there are massive data sets out there about how this happens in the past. And therefore, this allows you to predict what might happen in the future. And this is now a pretty accepted approach in research, effectively, that at some point during the design of your chemical, you will use cheminformatics to help you prioritize and get you to that lead series and that lead compound. And, and to your point, Sarah, this is making me think that it, it works in cheminformatics because the data is structured and standard. And I think what we're facing is that in perhaps imaging and clinical data, we don't have those same levels of standards. And I think if we want to make progress, we're going to have to find a way of getting those data into that massive structured data set that we know we can make progress from. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, so, question around, I mean, both of you are clearly very expert in cancer screening. Um, will there come a time when everyone will have access to cancer screening? I think so, yeah. I mean, um, I believe that in the next couple of years, we will get to the point where we will have tests that cost as little as $500 that uh, can screen for cancer ever in the body. We're certainly working on that at Ezra, and, you know, our scan is $2,000 now, which is cost prohibitive to a lot of people. Our mission is to make cancer screening available to everyone. And so um, to do that, we will get to the point where we can offer a full body scan for $500. Uh, we also offer a monthly installment plan. So that's as little as like $40 a month, which a lot more people can afford. But at $500, I think the important point is that it, be it starts becoming um, uh, relevant for in insurers and employers to start covering it because insurers could provide better outcomes while saving money. Uh, employers could pro increase productivity by helping uh, their employees detect cancer early. So I think the the 2020s will will be the the decade of um, full body cancer screening, and I believe it will be uh, affordable for everyone in the next few years. I think that's certainly true in the in the developed world. I think we have a long way to go in developing countries. 
I'm hoping that some other kinds of tests will be frontier tests for those kinds of environments. So the tests you were describing, the garden tests or the grail tests, so just you know, those early basic indicators um, that could then lead to the next step of having a scan. Um, but I would like, again, I think it's up to all of us to be intentional about this. And as we think about developing these technologies and we think about scaling them and we think about who needs them, um, that we start um, start there and you know how can we help um, people in Africa or in Indonesia? Um, how can we do that if we start there? I think ultimately we can have a big impact, but we're a long way from there now. Yeah, I, I, I strongly agree with that. I think it's important to think about um, screening in the context of the whole treatment of a patient and the economics of the whole treatment of that patient. Um, what tends to be um, very expensive and often ineffective is the later stages of treatment of metastatic disease after it has spread. Mm -hmm. um, often the disease at that point, the cancer is so large that the cells inside it are evolving to fight the very drugs that you're putting in to fight it. So I, I think the, the idea of moving towards universal screening is to me almost balancing um, that um, uh, from the management of late stage disease um, which is very expensive and often has a significant amounts of inpatient care, which is further expensive, towards, yes, a some cost up front, but it avoids that cost at the back end of it. Um, and interestingly, the, the, the great majority of commercial cancer research remains around the development of new drugs. And it's interesting to see that in the AI and ML space, we're seeing much more of the innovation coming earlier, which is where you guys are in terms of prevention, not, not prevention, excuse me, the earlier detection of those cancers to avoid all of that expensive and often ineffective late stage care. So I, I, I believe we will get more and more uh, early detection through more and more screening, whether that will be everyone being screened all the time, that will we'll see when we get there but i think certainly this is a way where a way where ai will have a significant impact on how people are treated much yeah. earlier uh, much less drugs more surgery and therefore getting away from that later stage coping with those cancers where surgery doesn't yeah. work and and i actually think james we we can also especially using imaging start talking about preventing cancer by finding things that are not yet cancer that uh, where lifestyle changes can um, have an impact. So for example, in Adesra in our full body, we often find uh, mostly men with uh, high fatty liver content. So they have like fatty liver disease. Now fatty liver disease can lead to cirrhosis. Cirrhosis leads to a less elastic liver, which can lead to cancer. And it would develop over a decade. So if you find you have a, a high uh, amount of fatty liver um, in your body, you could eat healthier, you could work out more, you could decrease your fatty liver content, you could track that over time and kind of make progress towards uh, decreasing your risk for liver cancer. Um, and so I do think that we can prevent cancer by doing, uh, by, by focusing on detecting the things that may become cancer in the future. And I, I really believe that like, this decade will get to turn cancer into something like diabetes. You know, it's not ideal to get, but it's not a, a death sentence. And yeah. the only way to get there is to find cancer early for everyone. So Sarah, we've got just a minute and a half to go. So your, your headline coming out of this. Um, be optimistic, be bold, um, get involved. This is an incredibly exciting moment in the history of the Emperor of all Cities. And I think, um, I, I just can't, I always say to my team, you know, it doesn't, you know, if we don't ultimately succeed in having the outcomes we want to have, we've made really important contributions to science. And I think that you know, keeps us going every day and it's just an amazing space to work in. So if you're at all tempted or already involved, um, get more involved in the ecosystem, as I said, hopefully 10 years from now we will have a completely different perspective on on the very meaning of that word, cancer. Brilliant. So given that half of us will develop cancer, we need to work on this now. So come and join us. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Cancer evolves. We just have to evolve quicker than it does. So thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you very much, Emmy. And thanks to the organizers, London Partners and COGX. Vernon, I believe we're back to you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, James, Sarah, Emmy. Here's to more accurate, um, accessible diagnostics and screening in the years to come for all. Thank you very much.